Okay, so I will start the third part of my lecture where I will build on what I've uh, shown you and how, how, part how particles or suspensions can be dealt with in a dynamically consistent way uh, within this or exploiting this lattice Boltzmann uh, approach. And um, I show at the end a few examples of how one can really look at details of the dynamics that could be overlooked otherwise. So it's in that sense, it's a very accurate, can be an accurate uh, method. And I wanted to show you how this can has been uh, exploited to study, uh, to, to be used to look at active suspensions. Uh, and again, maybe this is just a reminder and you have already gone through this, but uh, I'm thinking in micro swimmers or in, I mean, uh, or in, in, in colloids that can self-propel so in any case we are a very small there are small sizes typically viscous fluid so the Reynolds number is very small uh, so and I mean it goes back to Purcell that he noted or he made this point that if you have if you want to swim or want to displace in the liquid that very small Reynolds number you cannot use the you cannot use your inertia and therefore there are certain requirements to ensure that you can displace uh, because if you think and he uh, expressed that in terms of what he called the scallop theorem mm -hmm. if you only have one degree of freedom so you have a scallop that is opening and closing uh, then uh, whatever you are displacing in during part of this cycle in which you open then when you close you really uh, go back exactly to where you were and and therefore you need at least two degrees of freedom so there is a whole understanding on the, the minimal requirements for for this to happen. I will not go into, into detail. So there are a number of models that have been proposed that are minimal to, to swim. And one of the, the simplest one is this one by Najafi Kolestanian that there are only two degrees of freedom in, a, in an object that is moving cyclically, it's essentially in, in one dimensional fashion. Well, I, I, rather than that, I, I want to look or focus on what are the basic features of flows or symmetries of the flows or the coupling to, to the liquid medium that characterizes this, this type of displacement. Because the other important aspect is that there is no net force acting on this you know, swimmer. So swimming is because of the internal motion. And in that sense, it's different, for example, of uh, considering a particle that sediments so or that because of gravity just uh, moving downwards. So for example, if you have a charged particle and then you apply a, an electric field and that will that will displace. Uh, actually at low Reynolds number, if you if you consider a particle subject to an external force, the flow field that it generates decays as one over R. So it's algebraic. So it means that the sedimenting particle generates a flow everywhere uh, and that has uh, deep implications because then if you think now on, on a second particle that stays in the medium, then it will be, even if there would be no gravity acting on it, it will be buoyant. The flow generated by this other one will drag it. So there is a long range uh, correlated motion because of the, because the medium, again, is not passive, is moving. As, as I was explaining in the previous uh, lecture, the, the fact that there is this dynamical coupling uh, implies that one has to deal with these dynamics uh, properly and it has a, a very deep uh, consequences. The, this correlated motion due to the motion to the, to the perturbation in the medium are, are called hydrodynamic interactions. So, so this is very different from moving particles in vacuum where these type of couplings wouldn't be possible. Now I, I was mentioning the case of electrophoresis, uh, so the motion of a charged colloid under an applied electric field because in this case if you think in a charged colloid the colloid has a charge that's why it's charged but then the solvent typically has uh, salts that will counteract this charge globally the system does not have a net charge it's, it's very cost a lot of energy to have a system with a net charge so globally the total charge is zero so if i if i apply an electric field i cannot generate a global, uh, there's not like an external net force acting on the system as it, it is the case of sedimentation. And because of that, the flow field actually, I can move now. If you, you, so if I apply, say, an electric field pointing downwards, I have a colloid that has a positive charge, it will move 
downwards, it means that in the fluid uh, around it, there will be a, a net amount of negative charge. So that under the action of the electric field then will tend to move upwards. Uh, globally, then it leads to a, a different type of flow uh, that decays faster. In this case, it's R to the minus three. That's because of this different nature. So you could think that because a swimming particle object, uh, all, all this is at zero right now, number. because an, a, a small object moving in a, in a fluid does that without any net force, then you could expect or you could think, well, then it will be the same as uh, electrophoresis, but it's a little bit more uh, subtle than that because, uh, I mean, and that, that's is, one needs to look into the, the details of, of electrophoresis. And electrophoresis, typically, the salt is really lo localized very close to the particle, and the fluid flow that it generates has no vorticity. It's, a, it's called potential flow. This is a symmetry of this type of, of uh, motion. And for swimmers, micro swimmers, you can have micro swimmers with that generate flow that is potential, then this would apply to them, but they can have vorticity. Vorticity, I mean, again, this is a particular model, it's called a squirmer that I will describe now in, in more detail. Uh, and, and, and see this place is typically, again, depends on the details, but uh, this is a case where you have a particle that moves with vorticity. So the flow field is different from, from this one. You can see that there are some vort vortices here on the back of the moving particle. And again, uh, uh, the, this leads to uh, velocity profiles that decay as R to the minus two. So it's like in between these two cases that I was telling you here. So there are, there are other possibilities in between. Uh, an important consequence for, in the case of, of swimmers, of these vertical flows is that because now this vorticity is there, if I have another particle, so if I have two of these swimmers, micro swimmers, as, as I said before, the flow will generate this hydrodynamic interaction. So they can be advected uh, because of the neighboring uh, flow induced by the neighboring particle. But the vorticity will also have a tendency to make the particle rotate. And this is an example taken from a paper by Petley, uh, which indicates that in this case, it's not only that they will move in a correlated way, is that they can tend to align. So even if you have particles that are spherical, swimmers that are spherical, as, as in this case, uh, they can have a tendency to polarize uh, due to this uh, rotational uh, motion. And, and as a result, they, that can also enhance the uh, probability or the tendency for these two micro swimmers to swim together for longer than you would expect if, if they would simply be moving uh, with a prescribed directionality. So these hydrodynamic interactions in the case of swimmers, micro swimmers, can have very, a very strong impact into how they can move together. So, um, and again, I'm sure you will see this, uh, uh, but um, when a micro swimmer, when a, when a micro swimmer moves, is not only relevant how it displaces is how it generates or perturbs the flow around it. These are experimental results from, for example, chlamydomonas or from the flagellated, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this one is uh, for, uh, and for, sorry, for the chlamydomonas, you can see that during a period in which uh, it's beating this flagella, the two groups of flagella that it has in front, it, it leads to a number, I mean, a flow fields that change uh, as a function of time. Uh, this is now the same for uh, flagellated, uh, uh, this is E. coli, you can see here the flagella, and then again, the flow field uh, has a certain structure and principle that changes with time. And, and therefore, again, if I have other ones, then they will be coupled together. Here you can see in the case of the chlamydomonas, how you have these vertical flows, and actually the, the nature of these vertical flows is also time dependent. I wanted simply to emphasize that uh, I was talking about time scales before. Here, you also should worry about time scales. There is the same ones that I was talking about momentum diffusion and the particle diffusion. Now, there is because they move at a given velocity, there is now another characteristic time in which the, this, the micro swimmer will displace its own radius, will swim its own radius. And actually, typically, 
this time scale is in between the two. So again, one will depend on this on, on, on each system. Huh? But if you take typical velocities for uh, micro swimmers, typically that, that's the case. Um, and also depending on the size, what is not necessarily true is that the Reynolds number is small. So the, the role of, the, of inertia, this is for two, I mean, for Opalina and Paramecium, these are two, two microorganisms that have similar size, but then they swim at different velocities. So then the role of inertia uh, is low Reynolds number, but not necessarily zero Reynolds number. Whatever I will be telling you will not emphasize this aspect, but that's something also to take into account when deciding how to model these type of systems and uh, trying to understand the flow flows they, they give rise to. Uh, I wanted to focus or to, to show how you can exploit Lattice Boltzmann for one example of, of a model swimmer, which builds on a well-defined model in the fluid mechanics community, which was introduced by Lighthill and corrected by Blake, uh, and that's called a squirmer. The motivation of this model comes from uh, organisms, uh, this paramecium and opalina, these are ciliated microorganisms. So you can see, I hope you can see that these objects have uh, uh, many cilia on their surface. And this is a movie of, uh, where you can see how the cilia move together and generate what is called metachronal waves. This is in itself a hydrodynamic uh, phenomena. Um, let me show this to you again. But so these this, uh, waves that are generated in the cilia allow this organism to displace. Now, because these cilia are much smaller than the size, the typical size of the paramecium, from a hydrodynamic perspective, one can consider that there is the motion of the object, there is the flow that they generate around, and the whole effect of these metrachronal waves is to generate a slip velocity on the particle surface. So the Squirmer model says or assumes then that one can describe this, uh, this whole uh, activity uh, of, of the cilia through an effective uh, tangential velocity that will change with, with angle. And actually, in principle, I mean, by analogy with uh, what you know from uh, electrostatics, one can have a more or less complicated velocity distribution and one, but one can decompose this surface velocity in, in the analogous of what would be a spherical harmonics because it's, it's a tangential field. It's not the spherical harmonics, it's another set of functions, but one can work this mathematically. So if I know what is the surface velocity on a sphere, then uh, I can just decompose it. I mean, this is not a sphere, sorry. A squirmer model then is to convert this microorganism in a sphere and then assume that there is this uh, velocity as a boundary condition. And then if you know the velocity, the boundary condition of the velocity, and you can solve the Stokes flow, then you can work out which is the flow around it. And from that, one can uh, identify, sorry, let me, so this is a bit uh, technical, but the boundary condition can have, with respect to the direction of motion, uh, there will be a part that is radial and another that is depending on theta, uh, because in principle also these waves can lead to a small displacement in the radial component. I, I will assume that this is zero. That's what the usual model does. And therefore this only tangential and the tangential velocity is characterized by a number of amplitudes, V sub n, and then this can go n goes from one to infinity. And actually that's how the flow field looks like as a function, one can solve it, as I said, and as a function of all these amplitudes, okay? Now, what one can show, this is the flow field everywhere, one can now integrate the velocity on the particle surface, and that leads to the, uh, what is the center of mass velocity. The center of mass velocity of this squirmer now depends on only V1 of all these Vns that I was telling you, which is the, the total decomposition of the tangential velocity on particle surface, then only V1 leads to propulsion. As I said, I take this A to zero because I disregard the possibility that it grows and shrinks during this periodic motion. And one can also compute the local stress and then integrate the stress. That's the overall global stress that the particle generates in the fluid. That's called the stresslet by uh, 
field mechanics community. If one integrates this, this stress, the stress depends only on B2. So in principle, this uh, tangential velocity will have many components, B1, B2, B3. Uh, the B1 is the propelling velocity, B2 is the stress, and then it's like the multipolar expansion. And higher moments then characterize other aspects of the flow that this squirmer generates. Uh, so the standard squirmer model that people have been using after uh, it was proposed or solved uh, mathematically by Blake is to cut this expansion and keep only B1 and B2 because this has these two essential features of, of a swimmer, self-propelling velocity and then the stress uh, that generates around it. And also in principle here, you can see that these amplitudes may depend on time because this is, as I said, you saw in the experiments, there is a periodic motion, but then one can do, if one assumes that this beating it takes place on a time scale much shorter than the time scale in which it displaces, then one can take a pre-averaging and assume that these coefficients are constant and disregard this, uh, the motion or this over, over a period. So this is a kind of pre-average squirmer. And, and, uh, and that's what I will now show you. And as, as you remember, I said that uh, the nice thing of this lattice Boltzmann is that boundary conditions are local and that I can impose a proper boundary condition by assuming that the bounce back is done with respect to the local velocity. But now because there is this, this slip, I should add this slip into this local velocity exchange that I showed you in the previous lecture. So only by changing that local velocity that accounts for this slip velocity, I can move from simulating a passive particle to an active particle. So from the point of view of the algorithm, nothing structurally changes. It's only introducing this additional uh, element uh, to this slip velocity that accounts for this uh, effective, uh, assuming that there is this, this additional uh, velocity profiled on the particle surface that emerges from this scene. Okay. Doing that, one can then have uh, a squibber. And here I show you how these uh, velocity profiles generated by the squirmer. This is from Lattice Boltzmann simulations, where again, and, and here I've been changing this B1 and B2. I, I should go back because I went very fast. But as I said, if I only keep B1 and B2 for this tangential velocity, then uh, the ratio between B2 and B1 is what characterizes the squirmer because one of the two can be absorbed into a characteristic velocity. So what is relevant is what, how, how important is the stress generated by the particle with respect to the velocity at which uh, the magnitude at which they, they displace, okay? So here, something you can see is, okay, if uh, there is no B1, so if the particle does not propel, it only generates a stress. So if you would look at the particle itself, the particle does nothing, stays quiet. But if you look at the liquid, the particle acts like a pump, it just sucks in this case, uh, because of how I choose B2, sucks the fluid from the uh, horizontal and move it away in the vertical. So you could think that this is relevant for microorganisms because even if they do not displace, that's a way to attract food and get rid of uh, waste, for example. So, so that is relevant in itself from a metabolic point of view. I can go to the other extreme where B1 is different from zero, but B2 is zero. So there is no stress, only self-propulsion. This is what I would call a passive squirmer. In this case, the velocity profile that, that uh, generates these, the, the squirmer as it moves is the same as I told you for the electrophoretic colloid. So this is a case in which the flow is potential. So if there is no stress generated, the flow is potential. And in this case, the velocity decays as one over R cubed. But in the other, the other three, when B2, in this one, when B2 is different from zero, these two that I will show you now, B2 is different from zero, then the velocity decays as one over R squared. And that's what I referred also before, that there are in between this one over R asymptotic, one over R for sedimentation and the asymptotic one over R cube and R, one over R square, that depends on the nature of this free force motion that you can have flows with one type of behavior or another one type of symmetry or the other. So if B1 and B2 are different from zero, now then in that case, the 
particle will propel, the squirmer will displace, and the red arrow tells you which direction the, the squirmer is displacing, and then it generates vertical flows, as I showed you before. Now, depending whether B2 is positive or negative, then you will have uh, that the vertical flows can be generated in the back or in the front. So I don't know if you remember the Clam Clamidomonas was a time-dependent flow with the vortices, but if you average over a period, on average, the vortices, there is a, a vortical component in front. For the flagellative ones, there is typically a, um, like the E. coli, there is a vortical flow in the back. So changing the sign, you can go from what is called extensile to contractile, and then control not only the amount of stress and therefore vortical flow generated, but also how this vortical flow is distributed with respect to the particles motion. As I said earlier, it, this will have influence, uh, a, a strong role in how now these uh, squirmers will interact hydrodynamically with each other. Okay, so this, this, this simple model is already very rich and uh, brings in uh, two relevant aspects, the self-propulsion and then also the perturbation on the flow around, around it. So if you, if you have, uh, instead of two, one or two, now you take a suspension, what happens is that as they come together, then they can form flux. These are simulations where the, there is no attraction. So the squirmers are dealt with as essentially hardcore, but transiently they can come together and form aggregates. Eventually they can move away uh, due to the dispersion in the flows, but that is uh, something that emerges. Uh, and here I show you on larger uh, simulations, we, we, we looked, these are movies where you see them moving around, these, these arrows that you see red or blue, this is the direction of motion, uh, depending on the, which direction they are moving, and, and this is really like a three-dimensional box, and I project them on 2D, if the density is larger, you can see that there is no uh, tendency for, for them to, to condense, but they can form very large fluctuations, so there are all these transient structures and, and those are essentially controlled by these hydrodynamic interactions. So one can then compute density fluctuations. And something that I find interesting and, and is non-trivial is that we, we look, for example, at clusters, a cluster size distribution. We can count uh, these squirmers uh, when they are closer that, that a given uh, distance, they are relatively near contact. We can count them and then say, well, that's a cluster, and then see what is the size of the clusters. And, and actually, this is the cluster size distribution in the case in which beta is positive, a half, and this is negative. So this is, if you want, they propel at the same velocity, but here you have them uh, extensile and the others are contractile. And what you see is that the type of stress that they generate, whether they generate this, these vortices in the front or in the back, lead to different type of, of uh, cluster size distributions. If you look at the numbers, in this case, I mean, you, you have clusters of size, say, 10. Already hundreds are relatively uh, unlikely. Uh, while in the case of a positive B2, you can have, here you have hundreds or a thousand, you have much larger clusters that it naturally emerge. And this is a signal that this coupling, depending whether you have the vortices in the front or the back, uh, in this case, it favors much more this collective motion that leads to these transient structures that are much longer much larger. And also, uh, this is also a case where we exploited the, uh, the power in computation of, of lattice Boltzmann because, uh, so here I show you uh, for the same beta, results for systems of different sizes. We started with uh, a box that has 100 nodes in each direction, but we went up to uh, boxes with 1,000 nodes in each direction, which corresponds to this where uh, at the same volume fraction, same concentration. So as, as I increase the system, I have to put more particles. So we went from 2,000 squirmers to uh, 2 million squirmers. And this, I can tell you, is computationally quite expensive, but you can parallelize the code. It, it scales very well. So we really exploit the, the computational power of this method to be able to sample this uh, large, this wide, uh, large window of sizes. And why is this necessary? It's just not to, to use computer hours, but 
because when we started at small systems, you can see that cluster sizes distribution seem to have sort of like an elbow here, and which means that large cluster are proportionally more probable than smaller ones. And we were intrigued by that. So we start increasing size and you could see that this is clearly a finite size effect. And it was signaling simply that there is an algebraic tail here so that we could fit to, to minus four. So, so it's really a very broad distribution of clusters. And, and at some point, if the system was large enough, there was the possibility also to observe a very large cluster, I mean, proportionally much larger than the other ones, that is, again, uh, emerges as a result of this tendency for squirrels to, to swim together. And, and it was only by reaching these sizes, large sizes, that we, we could understand that there was really this underlying characteristic feature that is qualitatively different from what we observe for the case where we have beta of, of negative sign. So changing the sign, so changing the nature of, of this stress uh, has a qualitative impact in the emerging properties of these suspensions of the squirrels. Which I think it's, it's also a, a nice uh, example that is not only self-propulsion that matters, it's also only uh, it's also the stresses that, that play a relevant role. And, and that's also a good example as to why looking at the consistent, looking at consistently at the, at the motion of the squirmers and the solvent is really needed to understand the physics behind. Uh, I wanted to show you here now visually what, what was implied in the previous uh, cluster size distribution. So here I will show you three movies uh, where I, you will see uh, the case where you, here is where you will see these large clusters and then the cases where the clusters are not uh, seen. So here, because we have so many particles, rather than showing you all the, all the squirmers or the squirmers and the solvent, you will only see squirmers when they are part of a cluster and they will have a different color. So if they are blue, they are in clusters of size 200 and then up to 1000. And here, when you don't have this large cluster, you will see here, you will see the scale is different no? because again, the, the number of particles that you have depends on, on the value of beta and on the sign. But you will see how, as a function of time, initially, initially you don't see anything. That's, I mean, particles are there, but because still they haven't formed clusters, you don't see them. And as time goes on, at some point you will start seeing these particles appearing. And here is the number of time steps. So now you see them, you saw them, they appear, form and disappear because these are dynamical uh, structures. And then at some point, color is moving up. Uh, and then at some point you have these structures that are actually as large as the system size. So, now I run the, try to run the other, oops, sorry. I cannot run them at the same time. Here you see the same, in this case with smaller clusters. So I try to move this faster. So you can see how they appear, reappear, break and, and stay in this regime of a few hundred uh, particles. Uh, here on the left hand side, uh, the beta half is running again. Okay, so that gives you a visual image of what does it mean? Why computing cluster size distribution? What's the difference in the clusters that we observe by changing the nature of the, in the case, the magnitude and this, the sign of the stress? Okay. Right. Well, one can then also use the same model to study, for example, the rheology or uh, so one can now put these squirmers in between two planar walls, make them move with uh, uh, at the end velocity, then one develops a shear flow. And what happens then again, uh, in this case, I was comparing the case where B1 is zero or different from zero with different betas. And uh, you can see that they form uh, velocity, uh, sorry, yeah, these are the velocity profiles that form. If there would be only solving, it would be a linear profile. And, and now the accumulation of these particles change these velocity profiles significantly. This is more like a two block flows with uh, the, the shear is sustained only in one fraction. And when you 
into this polarity, how this uh, shear is uh, sustained, is, is, uh, changes. If for beta zero, so if there is no stresslet, only in that case, the velocity profile is linear, one can compute the polarization, so they tend to, to become pneumatic and also uh, compute, for example, the viscosity, the effective viscosity of the suspension and as a function, this is a way that we found this as a function of the velocity at which they, we, we, we shear. If, if the velocity of the wall is much larger than the velocity of the particle, that's essentially this, this, the ratio of these two velocities, we go back to the solvent viscosity because then part of the squirmers are simply dragged along. The, the, but if the velocities are comparable, then again, depending whether you have uh, contractile or extensile, you can have to a decrease or an increase of the viscosity. And then again, that's something non-trivial. So you can have shear thinning or shear thickening, depending, I mean, again, it's the, the B1 is the same. It's just changing the nature of the stress that modifies the rheological response, which is another example of how these, the, the, the importance of, of capturing the proper coupling and the stresses that uh, active squirmers or active moving particles generate in the, in the media. I wanted to finish very briefly. I, I've explained a bit in detail the squirmer model. There are other models that, that have been proposed to look at different types of squirmers. I was referring to this uh, simplest uh, uh, squ uh, swimmer with, with three beats, and one can implement that by another way of representing uh, particles that are suspended in a fluid in lattice Boltzmann, rather than representing the particle by a fully resolved object, uh, one can build on a model that was proposed by Dunberg and, and Alrich for polymers, where one tried to go to the other limit. A particle is has a radius that is smaller than the lattice spacing. This is a subgrid representation, and and in that case, then. Uh, because if, if you think of this as a particle, then how you keep this exchange of momentum between the particle and the, and the fluid has to be done differently. One needs to say that there is a coupling between, I mean, there is a force acting on this particle if the velocity that this has is different from an interpolated velocity of the neighboring fluid nodes. So it's, it's like a uh, a friction and then it's a relative velocity. This is not like Langevin because it's, it's not the velocity of the monomer that matters or the point particle. It's really a difference with respect to the neighboring particle fluid. So if, if the particle moves at the same velocity as the uh, interpolated velocity of the neighbors, then uh, there would be no, no force. Yeah? So one, one, can, I mean, one can work this out mathematically. I will not go into details, but one then can have, again, the same sort of idea of the momentum exchange, but rather than doing it through, the, through that links uh, that I was uh, referring to now, th this is done by this uh, exchange of momentum. So one can uh, determine by interpolating from neighboring nodes, which is the velocity of the fluid at the particle position, the difference between the particle position or velocity and the interpolated velocity gives rise to a force. This is the force acting on the frictional force acting on the on the monomer, and then minus that force is also distributed on the neighboring uh, node, so that then again total force is zero. So we conserve momentum, and this leads then, and then one can have also a, a kind of a, a Newton's type equation for for the beats, and that allows to then have uh, polymers in in a, in a liquid. One can then make them active. One can say that on top of, so one can have a typical for a polymer spring potentials or a chain potentials and bending. If one can, so as, as one does in polymer physics, uh, maybe you have seen this in, in other models. But then on top of that, one can say now in between neighboring nodes, they can be an active uh, force, so stress or so force in, in, say, in monomer 30 and minus that force in monomer 31 so that globally there is no net force uh, and then this is an actor so it's a set of force dipoles along the, the chain and then if, if one does that then and these are results also from lattice Boltzmann simulations the a chain like and that is perfectly aligned with this set of, of active dipoles generates flow around it with this 
geometry in this case because of boundary conditions it has the symmetry which again is another example in this case for this subgrid elastic object that is active then that it generates flow and these flows because this is elastic can lead to an instability and make them make this this polymer bend and as a result of the bending it can propel so this is a, a way also to simulate other families of uh, micro swimmers that are flexible, that are not rigid as the square mode that I, I, I was showing you before. So I'll, I'll finish here. I think I've shown you uh, the basics of the lattice Boltzmann, how to uh, move from simple fluids to suspensions and interactions with, with objects, and how one can benefit from the local nature of this algorithm with very simple modifications to be able to uh, introduce models for micro swimmers of a different nature, both rigid and flexible. Thank you very much.